Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to the wonderful Rachel Campbell. We're talking about how difficult journeys can still lead to brilliant endings. Rachel shares the story of her journey through the PhD and the challenges that she faced, but also the brilliant news of her getting her dream job. Along the way, we talk about passports, we talk about champions, and we also talk about why the PhD is like the Hunger Games. So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Good evening from freezing Canberra. <laughs> I know, bless you. You are at the the opposite side of the world, um, and we were just probably saying, quite so, literally, yes, <laughs> exactly. And we were just saying, so it's winter solstice with you. It was just summer solstice with us, but we feel like it's kind of auspicious because we're. I think we're, so. I think uh, um, yes, a uh, connection to um, you know the the rhythms of the universe, which certainly you have to be connected to some sort of rhythm when you're doing a PhD. That's for I sure. Love I love it, and I think it is actually that bit. That's a whole other podcast episode. But in terms of really attending to the seasons and where you are in the year, it's really important because your body will, even if your brain doesn't. <laughs> so that is absolutely, um... and being responsive to the um. The, the tricky times, the more fallow times, the high pressure times, like there is a natural sort of rhythm, I think, yeah, to the yeah. way a PhD um, unfolds. Um, yeah. You know, there's that optimism when you start where you're going to change the world with your your research and yeah. then some tough times, of course, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're here to talk about tough times really today. Um, but we are also going to just, I'm just going to promise everyone there's a happy ending <laughs> and this is that this is about kind of getting to live in the dream at the end of it all so uh we, that's where that's where we're heading but um we we're gonna also be talk about keeping the faith in the tough times too um, absolutely but before we get into that I just want to ask you um like I do with everybody in terms of just to give us um a bit of a sense of your story um into the PhD through it and out the other side Certainly. Well, I, I actually went to university late. I had my children first. Um, I have three children um, and I had become quite well known in my um, city for doing musical things and people expected me to have gone to university, but I hadn't. Um, so I thought I'd try to rectify that. And when I enrolled as an undergraduate, I just wanted to smash it out as fast as possible. I didn't care what I learned. I didn't care about the journey. I just really wanted the piece of paper. Uh. Um, um, and of course, I have a lot of empathy for students now who um, potentially are approaching in the same way. But, but of course, along the, the journey, I realize, you know, it's what you learn and who you meet and all those sorts of things. But I had a mentor, uh, Dr. Alan Davison, who encouraged me to do an honours year, which I did um, and was, um, you know, worked hard, but did it tough as well and got first class honours. And then he said, hey, why don't you do a PhD? And I thought being a doctor, you know, rather suited me. And no. I thought that I could <laughs> the most educated in my family and and I fancied putting doctor on my passport but really didn't have very good reasons other than that um, <laughs> I'd ever get a job in academia the state of the industry was so terrible and um, my PhD research was about portraits of musicians in the 19th century um, so it was celebrity studies and art history and cultural studies and I had a you know I had a whale of a time but I didn't think I I would sort of find an institution that had an alignment of the research interest. So I, I, I didn't ever think I'd get a job, um, but did the PhD, had some interruptions, had some really, um, you know, life altering things happen. And, um, and I did come out the other side um, and people now do call me doctor, uh, not my niece because she says I don't fix people um but other people do. And so it's been lovely um to get to the other side of it um, and and be able to achieve that goal but as you said um there is a happy ending and I, I don't know if now's the time to to give the secret away but um I do feel very um fortunate to be in the position that I'm in that I've been able to really capitalize on my other transferable skills and um and yes and we can explore the happy ending <laughs> whenever you're ready for me to reveal it I can tell everyone about the happy ending 
Well, well, what I love is, is that you, um, that you, well, I love that you've you've given a shout out to Alan Davison because we, I love, I love that we give shout outs to the to uh, the supporters here, and um, but also this sense of you said you wanted to put Doctor on your passport. That's one of the reasons that you started it. But also this idea, just to kind of to milk the metaphor of this sense of the PhD being a passport, being a way of accessing different um fields arenas so and i love that this is this is what it ends up being for you um and yes indeed we can we can let's not keep people in suspense you can tell us where <laughs> where you are now and then we can we can work back from that certainly so um it was the year before last actually i someone had asked me to do a little bit of sessional teaching and i have been a um, a music educator a choral director i've really been in that arena but done a lot of educating over the past 20 years um, but someone asked me to just do a little bit of sessional teaching at the University of Canberra and um, very quickly they offered me a fixed term contract um, for a fractional appointment of 0.8 um, which was last year this year they said we love you we love what you're doing so we're going to give you a full-time contract and actually just today I had my personal development plan meeting with my head of school and um they're offering me an ongoing position. So this is um, a dream in the sense that I've walked into a position. Um, I haven't had to win it except for with my skills. I haven't had to sort of um, apply or anything, um, but also the work I'm doing, I absolutely love. Um, and I'm teaching cultural studies um, to our first year. Uh, in, we have a set of core units in our undergraduate Bachelor of Arts degree. And my main job that I do is supporting students to be successful through pastoral care and well-being, but as an academic rather than a professional staff member. And I, I love this because um, I see, and for myself, you know, Alan was one of these for me, um, people have champions in their lives who say, hey, you should do this. This would be awesome. But then they actually need a champion when they get to that place. Um, and so that's what I like to think of myself as is a champion for students and we have students with a lot of equity needs at the University of Canberra. We have um, a lot of first in family um, students, uh, First Nation students, students from rural, regional and remote areas um, and sitting with um, these students and saying, what are your hurdles to learning? What are the barriers that are stopping you from being successful? Or what do I need to know about you to, to help you be successful? And working through those, I just, I really just love it. And so it's just been this delightful thing that's happened to me. Um, and, and I did work hard and I do have, um, you know, good skills and I, I have an expertise and I, I do have an empathetic sort of personality, but just to be able to really flourish um, in a university setting is just, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a delight and it's been something that I've even surprised myself at times. Um, when I was in my PDP meeting today, I said to the head of school, um, I said, actually, I'm having a great time. I said, I'm happy. I'm loving it. I'm challenged. And he said, oh, I wish we could um, bottle that and put it in an aerosol and spray it on some of the other faculty members <laughs> who have been here a while. So, yeah, I'm feeling um, even just today more acutely, I'm very happy with, with, with where I've landed for sure. I love that. I love that. And congratulations on the contract. And, and I can absolutely hear the passion in your voice. Love it, love it, love it. And this really important thing about the champion. And I think that um, especially coming into the PhD, the PhD journey, of course, starts many years before the PhD. <laughs> and, and you're kind of looking towards that. Um, and, and then when you get there, as you said, you still you need a champion still it's 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 a you're into a next phase of a journey rather than having arrived and so this this sense of looking out for your champion um and uh making sure that they you've got someone in your corner um so thank you for reminding us of that i think it's so critical not just to have you know your supervisors um and Alan was a supervisor and even when he moved institutions, um, but someone who's real with you, someone who's compassionate, um, someone who's interested in you getting the results um, and not just interested in, you know, I'm, I'm pedagogically sort of analysing at the moment this idea that, you know, we did the tough way and you have to pull yourself up by the bootstraps as well. I just hate that so much because I think it just, yeah, it lacks a compassion and, 
and an empathy for for what people go through during the PhD. And of course, when you do something for a long time, stuff is going to happen to you. You're going to have tough times just beca- because of the reason of you're doing it for ages. So stuff's going to crop up, you know. Um, and I think having that compassion, having that someone's got your back, um, but in a really practical way, um, I think that's just so, so important. Um, and I've been lucky to have that in my life. And it's a pleasure to be that for students now too. Gorgeous. So, so gorgeous. Um, so, yeah, so we know it all, it all turns out well in the end. But now, like with all the good films, we're going back through the montage. <laughs> so that actually, as you say, things happen. And, and again, when we're looking forward into a PhD journey, we just think it's going to be, you know, we, we just think of the highlights. We don't think that things are going to come in and life is going to happen. But of course it does, because like you say, you're going to be doing this for a long time. And so life events happen. So can you tell us a little bit about what came up for you on your journey and, and how how you handled it? Certainly. Well, I um, I don't often do things the easy way, put it that way. So I, I worked full time um, when while I did my PhD. I also did my PhD full time. Um, so and I had three little kids. So that was certainly a challenge in, in itself. And, you know, people say, oh, do you think it's a very good idea? And I'm like, I'm just going to do it because I'm so focused on, um, you know, putting doctor on my passport at that point. And I really also wanted the regalia. Um, cause I thought that was pretty, pretty snazzy. So, um, but my, I am the next of kin for my mum. Um, and unfortunately about five years ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, very treatable form, thank goodness for modern medicine. But, you know, that took up a lot of time and, um, and emotional energy in, um, supporting her through that journey. Um, yes. and then about six months before I was due to submit, uh, my marriage ended, um, and I'm a very much, you know, taken in my stride kind of person. Um, but one of my supervisors, um, not Alan, said to me, like, seriously, you have to take an interruption. You, you know, you have to have an intermission. You can't deal with this and support your kids and, you know, move houses and do all that kind of stuff unless you take a, a break. So yes. Um, yes. I bargained him down from three months to five weeks <laughs> because, <laughs> um, you know, as I said, don't like to do things the easy way. Um, and and took the five weeks off and I think partly I you know I was stubborn um because I feel too that as women we have a lot of pressure on us to do all sorts of things and be these super mothers and and super academics and super students so I I did feel there was a bit of that sort of societal pressure in a gender sense um on on me um whether I put that on myself or whether it was real you know I still sort of felt it but um so some of the challenges I took in my stride and some like, you know, at that time when my marriage ended, um, my supervisor really just put his foot down and, and said, no, you need, you need some time. Um, and you know what? It was okay. And I think that um, maybe that's a message for, for listeners is that if you need time, that's okay. Um, and moving back to our chat about, you know, the seasons and the rhythm that there is going to be times where the season is rest. Um, the season is is put yourself first and the season is, you know, put your own oxygen mask on before you <laughs> try to try to do other things. So um, I probably would do things differently. Um, if I had my time again, I'd be a little kinder to myself, I think, um, because I tell students all the time, you know, university was invented in the year 1000. It's not going anywhere. Um, but that's that's nice. that's advice that I, I find it hard to, to listen to for myself, I guess. Yes. Oh, yes. And I am so sorry to hear that those that, you know, that's been part of your journey. Um, I hope your mum is is fully well and vibrant now. Um, and I'm so sorry to hear about the the breakup of your marriage. And th- this sadly, relationship breakdown is something that's very common um, along the PhD journey, too. That that can happen to lots of people. Um, and so this sense of I love you. This vision of you bargaining. Well, you know, it'll be, I'll be fine. I'll be fine a few weeks. I'll be fine. Um, and again, that's very common because people tend to see the interruption as a, as some kind of failure of like I've not Absolutely. done it properly. Um, rather than a very common experience, and it is part of honouring the, the the phase where you are. I, I really think everybody should have a kind of 
in whatever you, it's called in your in your university, you know, intermission, um, like whether it's called all sorts of different things, but you should get a voucher at the beginning that you can kind of cash in at some point. <laughs> um, uh, or a few vouchers. Yeah, like a hall in. pass. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. It's like a um to collect two hundred dollars on the way pass go or whatever is a monopoly. I, I think you're absolutely right. Is that there needs to be structural and institutional change, I think, culturally to support PhD students because the 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 experience is so vast and varied um and and not not all of us have linear sort of trajectories in fact I would say most don't most, yeah, um and there's don't. this irritating ad on Facebook that I get all the time which is um <clears throat> a, a fella saying here's how I um did my PhD in two and a half years and published 12 papers in you know Q1 journals and it makes me want to scream because um you know, and the comments are fantastic. The comments are all these, you know, academic women saying, oh, well, did you have a wife or did you live at home with your mom or whatever it is? <laughs> um, because it's so not the, it's, it's, it's not indicative of, of what the general um, and more common experience is, I think, um, especially for women, especially for mothers, um, yeah. you know, yeah. when, when our hearts are torn between solving the problems of the world with our research and, tucking our babies into bed every night you know um and and there was a lot of nights I didn't tuck my babies into bed um and they've turned out okay as well <laughs> so that's yes, probably yes, another yes. takeaway for listeners yes 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 and I, I love that you're highlighting the, the kind of gendered aspect of this too and 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 you know there's going to be there's all sorts of different demographic things that come into play in terms of the particular challenges that people might face but I think this sense of 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 it not being a failure it's acknowledging that life is happening and um and again you know i guess there is the past already does exist because these systems are already there there are systems for extenuating circumstances there are systems for compassionate leave there are systems for sick leave they are there because people need them and um, because we're human beings um and it isn't a failure at all and and kind of taking taking that time and like you say you took that time I wonder how it was to kind of come back in after your after your five week or to, what was it yeah. like to go out and what was it like to come back in? Do you know, I think um between you, me, and however many listeners you have, Emma, I probably <laughs> It's only a few thousand those, uh, people, don't those five weeks. <laughs> um I probably did um, you know, write a few things or or think about a few things, but I think that it took the pressure off. Um, so that if I felt good and I felt like I had a little bit of space to do a bit of work, I could do that. But the pressure wasn't on for deadlines and meetings and, you know, write me this chapter or that chapter. So um, I kind of had the best of both worlds. I had a safety net there. Um, and then I do feel that, you know, it did give me that space to focus on the children and the moving of the house and the selling of the house and all of those sorts of things. Um, yes. And so I don't have strong memories of sort of having this grand moment where I came back because I think it's um, something I haven't said is I did my my PhD at the University of New England um, in Armidale, Australia, and I did it um, by distance. So I wasn't on campus. So it's not like I made a triumphant return to my office right, on right. campus. Right, right, right. You know, right. I probably just opened my laptop on the couch kind of thing on one day yeah. um, when I was ready to come back. So um it's probably not straightforward in lots of ways, but I think again, just mentally, the space was probably, um, yeah, really useful just from a, a healing perspective and a rest perspective. Yes, 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 and actually, this is very, very common that people take you kind of officially get some time. That doesn't mean that you you. I mean, this is we need to be careful with this. So it doesn't mean you need to carry on with stuff. So let's just be clear on that. But it also means you can do it. If you want to, if you took six months off, like you say, it could give you some space. The pressure is off um, and it allows you to have a have a sort of a potter around with your PhD if you want to um, without the pressure. Um, so I think that, that, again, that's very common that people might take the time off and then just allow themselves to be with the material as it works for them. For some people, it will be more extreme time away. Um, as is appropriate but I, I think that that's important to note too is that you can take make that time work for you um and I think always I would always advise people to sort of try and take that maximum amount of time and um, because everybody's going to be really happy if you 
come back early or hand in early. Um, and it's more difficult to negotiate extended deadlines later on in the process. So I think that um, allowing yourself time and space um, so that you can look back on that time, like you looking back on that time and going, yeah, no, I had time to to make sure that I was able to move house in the in the best way possible and do what I needed to do in that moment. Because you want to book, look back over your PhD time and the life that happened while you were doing it with happy memories as part of it. <laughs> that's right. And I do, I think that's that's exactly right. But it's also for me is modeling good behaviors to my children. Yeah. Um, and you know, saying no, I'm I'm I need I need a break and that's okay. Or saying um, you know, I'm a bit overwrought or, or whatever it is. And I didn't want to put my own children off going to university um, right. because there was a time there, I think during my honours year, um, where my son, my middle son was like, I'm never going to university. And I said, well, that's okay, mate. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, you don't have to go to university. And he'd say, what do I need to do to get a job if I really love rocks? And I was like, well, that's geology, mate. You'd go to university to study that. <laughs> and he'd go, okay, I'm not going to do that. What if I wanted a job um, where I, you know, looked at paintings? And I'd be like, well, art history, mate, that's university as well. <laughs> and this went on and on for a while um, because I didn't want them to, you know, have that um, sort of like to see me just struggling the whole time yes, and crying yes. and drinking wine and, you yes. know, having a breakdown. I wanted to model, um, yeah, that it, that learning is pleasurable and, and all of those sorts of things so that they could just follow their own path without being scarred by my experience as well. I love that. <clears throat> I love that. And we talk about this here a lot <clears throat> in terms of everybody, you know, the family is going through the PhD experience. Your littles are going through it with you and they're seeing what's happening um, and they care about you and you care about them and so that has to come into the mix it has to come into the mix um and um i'm i'm delighted that you were able to have that moment with them and it still all worked out well in the end um because i, I think that again people kind of feeling like they need to take some time out think oh well this might be it then i that you know I'll, I'll take time out and i'll never come back to it and it will when you know it kind of it feels a, a massive step and it is you know it, it, there is it's a, there's a step to it but it it can be just part of the process can't it absolutely and a natural part of the process i think in my um you know i've met a lot of uk colleagues um through women's academia support networks and things as you know in the same way that you and i connected emma yes, and yes. i think in the uk it seems um, much more difficult um, and that the, the the process is um, sort of more stringent and seems to be a bit, you know, can be a bit traumatic at times. Like we don't defend here, for instance, we don't have a Viva in, in, um, in Australia. So, um, and I, I'm, you know, PhD students are covered by fair work rules and all that sort of that stuff. Wow. So I think, you know, I often thank my lucky stars that I did an Australian PhD in lots of ways because um, it does seem to have some more sort of um, sensible approaches maybe um, than this kind of more, you know, the Hunger Games style, um, you know, <laughs> academic life <laughs> where everyone just gets thrown in in an arena and, and you hope for the best. So I think there's probably some cultural differences there. Well, I, I don't love it, but what a brilliant metaphor in terms of it being like the Hunger Games Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes, indeed, there are good practices out there in PhD land. And let's hope that we learn from each other and start to think about, OK, well, how, you know, let's let's take that bit from that model because it's really humane and thoughtful and all of that. Um, oh, Rachel, I, this, thank you so much. Um, I'm aware of time, so we, we need to kind of um, come to a close now. But I always ask people for um, a top tip. So if what would you share with the people who are listening? Yeah, I think my top tip is um, probably to back yourself, um, is that, yes, you need a champion, but you also have to be your own champion. And if there is an intermission or a life event, um, is to sort of back yourself and say, no, I need a break, or yes, I can do this, or you know, I need a bit more specific help or or whatever. And um, in a way, um, we we lead the charge of our own PhD um, very much, you know, from the front and by ourselves. And um, I think, again, if I could just speak to the gendered aspect, you know, as women, um, you know, so often we have to be our own champions. And so, I yeah, I think that's probably 
Um, there's there's probably a lot a lot of tips out there, but I'd say yeah, back yourself and and the day will come. Um, the day will come where you get your amazing regalia. Um, and and it feels great to put it on, and it feels. I feel mine's very heavy. So I feel the weight of it on my body, but I also just feel the success and I feel the hard work and I know how much work went into it. So for me, um, my regalia really signifies all of that. Um, and I love wearing it um, to graduations and um, it always gets a lot of comments. So I feel, um, you know, that journey. And I, I, I did back myself. I, I had to um, along the way here's the thing exactly you don't own, only get a phd you get a great frock as well so it's all good it's all to play for oh man <laughs> mine is just so glorious i can't wait to send you a photo i'm so chuffed with it <laughs> Amazing. oh rachel thank you so much um and um i wish you well in the next part of the of the journey congratulations again on your on your new job um and thank you all for listening 